One was buried in St. Mary's Church, and the other in Mary's choir. Over Queen Isabel there grew a red rose, and over her lover the they grew, they grew to the church steeple top until they could grow no higher and then not it together in a true lover's night for all the world to admire. Language isn't lost overnight, you know. There's a process that goes on, and that process of language shift, it's probably best called shift rather than loss. Um, that process was beginning in the early 17th century and uh, is still continuing. And the process is not finished. One hears about internal migration or internal exile. I think language shift is internal exile as well. It's, it's kind of internal psychological exile. The kin, I think, to a kind of an emigration where there's actual physical emigration. Migrants brought their home native language with them to the new world and spoke it to their children. The children also learned English and when they married they passed on a certain amount of it so that you have three generations involved. In Ireland in this internal exile an attempt was made to do something much more painful and brutal which was to change the language in two generations. That must be a terribly painful thing for both the parents and the child to have to struggle to communicate uh, in intimate situations across uh, a language shift with the parents not having enough English to be comfortable with and with the children having maybe neither one language nor the other in any kind of polished way. The soul, it wakes to itself in sin and loneliness and secrecy. It has a slow and dark birth, more mysterious than the birth of the body. When the soul of man is born in this country, there are nets flung at it to hold it back from flight. You talk to me of nationality, language, religion. I shall try to fly by those nets. I think if Joyce came back now, he would be somewhat scandalized at the skill with which his successors emulated him and undermined language, nationality, uh, and religion as narratives, and found that all they were left with in the end was the market. And I think Joyce wouldn't have been happy about that because, because you know, he, he wanted to challenge those narratives, but only because he took them seriously and because he thought they were important. And also, I think, because he thought they were mispresented to his generation. I think that Joyce is actually quite a religious writer, not just someone who wrote about religion, but was you know, conducting an alternative spiritual search and was interested in the same issues that religion addresses. What he hated was the way the Catholicism of his time had declined to a kind of rule-keeping moralism, which tried to describe people's relations with one another rather than a true religion, which is about your relation with destiny, with the gods, with the infinite. What do you think of organized religion? I mean, from, from where you're coming now? We need shelter. Our houses don't shelter us. They shelter us from some of the elements, but deep down in our souls and our minds, we have needs. And we are exposed inwardly to dangerous places within ourselves. We are exposed to longings. There are, there are like Cleopatra, there are eternal and immortal longings in us. 
And we need a religion to shelter us in our depths, to shelter us in the places where ordinary culture, secular culture can't shelter us. So religion is about shelter, and we need shelter. And I need the shelter of myth, I need the shelter of religion, I need the shelter of a great house. I mean, when Philip Larkin goes to a church, do you remember, he's walking in somewhere in England, and he comes upon a church, and he takes off his bicycle clips, and he parks his bike against the gable end, and he walks in, and he goes up to the holy end of the church, he gets the musty smell, and he reads a bit from the, op from the, from the open book uh, that is there in the lectern, and his words echo around the house, and he thinks, what in God's name are we going to do with these churches? like, you know, will we rent them out rent-free, will we let them out rent-free to sheep and rain, or will we keep one of them and keep it permanently in show? And so he's walking in at the end of a Christian tradition, but then mm. th th there's that last wonderful stanza, a serious house on serious earth that is, in whose blend they are all our complex compulsions beat, are recognized and roped as destinies, and that much never can be obsolete. For someone will be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it towards this ground, which he had once was proper to grow wise in, if only so many dead lie round. Now, he's naming it here, like it is a serious house on serious earth. I mean, where the central bank is built, that isn't a the central bank, isn't a serious house, and it has made the earth that it's sitting on unserious. We will always need a serious house on serious earth, because in our depths, however much we cooperate with the silliness of the modern world, or with any world, however there is huge, serious life in us. And when life in you is serious, you need a serious house.